Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch, and I'm here with Dr. Lin Ho, who's an assistant professor of linguistics at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and a signer of American Sign Language. But first, it's thanks to our patrons that we're able to expand the podcast into interesting new formats, like a video episode about signed languages, uh, which is one of our most requested topics. To become a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash enthusiasm. Hello, Lena, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Happy to be here. It's so nice to have you on the show. So this is a question that we start with all of our guests. How did you get into linguistics? Whoa, that's a fascinating story if I do say so myself. Well, <clears throat> my parents are from Taiwan. When I was about seven or perhaps six, it was the first international trip that my parents had brought me on. We went to Taiwan and they are from Taipei, which is the capital of Taiwan. And I thought, well, I knew deaf people were in the United States and they had their own sign language, that being American Sign Language or ASL. But my trip was the first time that I had actually witnessed another sign language. My mom went to a deaf institute there and we saw sign language. Uh, and it was a sign language that wasn't quite mine. And so it was Taiwan Sign Language. But something was quite different and I didn't understand what they were saying. The deaf people were signing and I was quite fascinated. So at that moment I began to realize there are different sign languages in the country, in different countries. And so I began to think, hmm, maybe that's something I want to do later. So I began studying various sign languages. The problem is that you can't go into a library or a particular place and look at a grammar that has been published. You have many users and speakers of that language. And so when I got into, you know, linguistics, I began to study the language. With sign language, though, it's almost impossible to go into a place like that. And so I happened to meet various deaf people in different countries, and that was really excited. And I thought, where do I meet them and what do I do? So it's something that I kept in my mind, in the back of my mind, until I was an adult, and then I had the opportunity to travel the world and meet various deaf people. And so you took linguistics at school, or you? How did you be? How did you get from these are so cool to I am a professor doing this? Well, that's another story. Linguistics, I think, for the first time, they I heard about it when I went to college. I went to UC Berkeley. The University of California uh, at Berkeley as an undergraduate student and linguistics wasn't my thing but uh, I had a friend who was studying linguistics and uh, they had to take it for their major not linguistics uh, itself but majors like cognitive science or um, computer science sorry computer science rather and so I in general uh, was interested in that so people had to take that to satisfy major. So mm -hmm. I had a deaf friend who took a few linguistics courses. The problem was that they said it's really hard. He actually had taken phonology and for some reason had to do a lot of lab work. So he was talking about this and I thought oh, maybe linguistics is the study of, yes, language, but for spoken languages only. And that was my first impression. Yeah, so how do you do phonology so, with, the sign, with the sign language? Maybe we're getting off track here. Well, yes, how, you know, I didn't know because phonology, I thought, was related to sound. And no linguist for sign language. Yeah, so, so right, I didn't think there was linguistics of sign language, and uh, so I wasn't sure what to do. Okay, so what, what happened next? Uh, my major was comparative literature. I was fascinated with reading books uh, during my whole upbringing. And I thought it was interesting to think about that for grad school, but at the same time, I, I wasn't sure. So I met other grad students in comparative lit, and it didn't seem like they were having 
fun. <laughs> you know, we'll learn more language is interesting and that's fun. But, you know, learning enough to become fluent in reading literature and then write papers about it and then give presentations and talks, I thought in the beginning, well, yeah, many languages are signed and spoken. Many don't have written systems or components for them. So if I study uh, only the written system, then I think, you know, that's the tradition of literature. So if I wanted to study ASL, for example, then how would I do that in a comparative lit? And so, yes, we do have ASL literature, which I can discuss briefly, but I wasn't really sure what I should do. So I dropped the idea of studying that and I thought about something else. So after college, I met more deaf people and it just so happened I was living in the Bay Area in San Francisco and there's a diverse group of people who some are uh, deaf migrants. They have moved to the United States. They brought their own sign language. So I met a lot of these people and I realized as they're learning American Sign Language, you can realize and see at the same time that they have their own accents. Mm. And uh, as their first language from whichever home country they are from and then learning American Sign Language. And I can understand the concept of accent in sign language. So hearing people talk about accents from other countries, uh, parallel idea. So if someone's first language was British Sign Language or French Sign Language or something, then they could have a British BSL or FSL accent in ASL. Yes, yes, and I could see that. So BSL, yes, British Sign Language, and LSQ, did you say, or? Uh, well, French Sign Language, <laughs> or, or LSQ, which is the Quebec Sign Language, Langue des Quebecois. Yes, yes, LSQ is special in its own right because uh, the language emerged from LSF and ASL oh, okay. uh, because it has uh, regional contact, but there's history to that. I feel like I should know more about LSQ because I live in Montreal, but I don't actually know anything about it. <laughs> mm. Well, it's an interesting story because ASL is from old French sign language. Uh, many sign languages of the world tend to are bring through deaf schools and that's how the language is passed on. So that happened with LSQ and ASL. So LSQ, well, let me hold that story. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We'll get to that later. <laughs> We're still in your life story. <laughs> you yes, met a bunch yes. of deaf friends. They spoke different sign languages. Uh, you were like, they have accents. This is so cool. I'm going to study this? Yeah, pretty much. I um, just based my everyday life in socializing with various deaf people, and uh, it was exciting. I was fascinated with their accent, and at the same time, the use of everyday language. I was fascinated with their structure, uh, the function of the language, how people talked about various things in everyday life, and uh, how they would tell stories, the poetry, how they express complex ideas, just the possibility of talking about anything in sign language. And I wanted to study that. And so I thought, well, what can I do? As I mentioned, I'm a serious nerd. I read a lot, total bookworm. And so I rolled up my sleeves and I looked for a book to see if there was anything written about sign language, anything about um, ASL or otherwise. And I found one book, in fact, <laughs> one book. <laughs> and I think it was called, I forget the exact title, uh, it was about ASL and linguistics. We can link to it in the show notes. Oh, okay, that would be great. So that's how I found my PhD advisor, because oh. I read, and often all the linguistics books are referred to other people's work and what have you. And so I was reading, and there was one chapter that talked about a person and how ASL marks first person, singular, and non-first person, uh, second or third person, you or she or he, etc. And it just so happened they mentioned uh, my PhD advisor, Richard Meyer, referring to his work on person that he has done. And I thought, oh, this is very interesting. And his work fascinated me. Maybe I should apply for the University of Texas in Austin and work with him. 
And I knew that he had also researched the acquisition of sign language for many years as well. And so I thought, hmm, that's fascinating. I could learn about acquisition. I could learn about sign language. My whole life, you know, I was fascinated with how deaf people learn sign language. Because most of us, including me, we are born to parents who are hearing, don't sign, and we learn sign language then through meeting other deaf children in school or social events, and got lucky that I met someone who had deaf parents. Mm-hmm. And I was a child when I met my first uh, deaf family, so to speak. So I thought, wow, well, yeah, it's like hearing children, or, you know, they learn language from their parents, and then they actually just are deaf. And so that was, um, it's a rarity in our community. So. So you got interested in how kids, how deaf kids learn sign language as, as kids versus, you know, with, with other kids around the same age, like whether they learn it from their parents or from, from other kids? Yes, exactly. Was that your research topic in grad school? Yes. Uh, that was my enthusiasm when getting into grad school. Ah. I didn't quite understand what the research meant. I thought, oh, it'd be fun to learn more. And so I applied <laughs> at Austin, and I didn't realize that grad school oh, was a serious thing, <laughs> uh, a serious endeavor for sure. I literally, you know, started your career when you applied for grad school. Uh, it happens to some of us. <laughs> and luckily, Richard uh, accepted me. And then that began my journey into uh, research, I guess. Uh, and so, yeah, so what did you end up doing your dissertation on? Well, I thought I was going to research how deaf children learn ASL in, in general terms, and it was pretty vague at that time. And then I took Richard's class on introduction to linguistics of sign language. And they talked about uh, various sign languages and the emergence all over the world and various uh, sign languages that have popped up. And so we talked about Nicaraguan sign language. And many people know about that because it's often referred to and cited in publications, perhaps on radio and some in film. So I was fascinated with the concept of how deaf children can make up their own language in a school, for example, at least in that context. And also, I had heard about other sign languages, like ABSL, which is uh, the Bedouin, al Said Bedouin Sign Language, which is a very small area uh, in, with a number of deaf people in Israel. And the concept of language emergence in, in a, not in a school, per se. Like the village sign languages. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, so like in a family. Yeah, so there's a really nice video on YouTube about uh, Nicaraguan Sign Language, which we can also link to if people want the whole story on that. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you were looking at all these different kinds of sign languages emerging, and this turned into... I haven't actually read your dissertation, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 totally not. Please don't, actually. Many um, people say I mean, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Right. (laughs) I was thinking, well, there's so many interesting topics that I could research. How do I begin? And where do I start? I didn't realize that, you know, to be in the right place at the right time and meet the right person could definitely shape my future. And so I was thinking about my work, and obviously Richard wasn't working on Nicaraguan Sign Language at the time. And so I thought, hmm, well, my department was very inter- Well, I'm sorry, my old department. I have to back up. Right, because you're at UCSB now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's hard. My department chair told me, stop saying your PhD advisor. He's not yours anymore. <laughs> Because you're all grown up. And so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, because you met Hilaria Cruz, who we did another interview with uh, for Lenthusiasm, and you also started working on uh, Chatina Sign Language, or uh, exactly. the one that's spoken in her community. Yes, yes, that is correct. So, the University of Texas in Austin has a great program 
for training indigenous scholars. And it just so happened that I met a friend, Hilaria Cruz, who um, was a few years ahead of me in the program. And she had written, uh, she'd written her name in the IPA on the board. And I thought, oh, interesting. And uh, through her, I met her sister, who was also a PhD student at the time in anthropology. And somehow I was learning about their life story and we got to know about uh, each other. We became friends, I guess, and it just kind of happened. Um, we'd see each other every once in a while. And then the three of us were curious about one another because we're all very different. They're from a small community in Oaxaca, Mexico, and I'm from Southern California, <laughs> and I'm deaf. <laughs> and it's kind of a strange coincidence that we met. They seem to be fascinated with seeing a deaf person who studies sign language in the linguistics department. That was a new concept, I guess. A novel concept for many people in general at the time. It, perhaps more for them because they have several deaf people in their family who clearly lead a different life than mine. And so they told me uh, about some deaf people and I asked them questions but they couldn't respond and they said, we don't know, you'll just have to come and visit and meet our family and see what it's like. It's so cute, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, so it just became, well, that kind of conversation, you know, led to one thing, and it was the first opportunity that I thought, well, you know, I had never thought that I could fly to another country like Mexico and go in a van afar and travel about eight hours in a van to, it maybe was longer, and go an all whole day trip to the village and so I wasn't really sure could I go could I do the work and you know I don't want to be one of those linguists who just shows up and says hi I'm here ready to study you so we had that conversation uh, Hilary and I talked about going to the village and uh, then I went and I continued to go and after a while I felt ready to begin to work, and then that's when the visits began. I watched Hilary and how she worked with them. She recorded them and speaking the language from the elders in the village, especially for um, the new year. And it was a fun activity. They had some celebrations, and um, you know, it was the hours just continued all day and all night, and it was really fun to meet some deaf people there that led me to meet other deaf people in the village but it wasn't just deaf people it was the whole life of chitino people and that experience of socializing with people and how they accepted and thought about deaf people and it was very natural deaf people uh, don't have access to education there there's no support for a use of sign language in schools in the local schools and so maybe Hilaria may have mentioned that the schools only use Spanish mm -hmm. as the language of formal instruction, and that's another problem on top of those who are deaf. And so, so. but they, they communicate with each other and with their, their family and friends and stuff in the village? Mostly in just in the family. That's another thing I learned, but uh, it took me a while to figure this out, years in fact, that how, well, who people talk with is really intentional. Mm -hmm. And so anyone does not speak with everyone. Oh, okay. And so it was interesting. Part of their social life is that everyone is organized within the family and the extended family. And everyone who is in the family, they have a kinship and they are in this family unit. It's as though, uh, like a speech community, when you go into and enter a speech community, you have a relationship with one another, some good, some bad, and some strongly political. Mm. So 
you know, different than my life here, you know, based on the type of relationship that we have in some ways. It's very similar in that way for the Chitino people. So for deaf people, their relationships in the village are strongly associated with family and kinship. And that's who they communicate with mostly. I was fascinated to see how they made up signs in order to communicate and to get what they needed for everyday life. A little bit different than mine. You know, I work within linguistics all the time. I use very abstract, sophisticated terminologies at times uh, with my colleagues and my collaborators versus using language, you know, to make sure that people understand. And so with most Chitinos, they have their own language. They talk about what is relevant, relevant in their life. That was fascinating, and that became my dissertation topic after a while, eventually. <laughs> and so you were figuring out like what, what kinds of signs people use there, and like how the, how the social structure fits into that, and, and all this different stuff. Yes, exactly. The most fascinating part was how language emerges mm. there uh, during interaction. That's my focus. How it happened in a place that is not a school. Not an educational system, it's deaf and hearing people and family members uh, in a group. Because hearing people also use these signs as well. Yes, if they socialize with uh, deaf people, mostly, yes. And if they live with them, then they definitely do communicate with them. Or if they work with deaf people, yes. And did you find that it was like uh, the al Sayyid Bedouin Sign Language, where they have a kind of village sign language because there's a high proportion of deafness and they have this, this kind of village sign language, or is it a different thing from that? Well, it is different for many reasons. I think the community where ABSL emerged is special because it is a large proportion and it's um, agriculture, well, how would you, it's a big, it's a village with a large number of deaf people who have been born there and uh, have been in the same family. So a clan, if you will, and people in the community of 3,000 plus people, there's no other community like that that has ever been discovered. So it's quite special in that fact. And so where I work is a very small number of people, maybe 10 deaf people in total, I think. Oh, okay. And so that's a big comparison to the Bedouin village sign language. And again, people that I study are mostly related. So if you can analyze the family, and look at the kinship and the relationships, then they are all socializing together every day. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, deaf people in the family mostly have hearing people. Mm. They may have some relatives or other siblings. It's not like there are um, deaf people, like there are in the Bedouin Sign Language where there are masses of deaf people within families. Right, okay. So that means that I guess if you compare it with, um, with uh, if you look at Chitino sign language or what I, it's in a academy, you need to name things as separate <laughs> languages. It's not really called Chitino sign language, but people who use the language don't have an official name for the language. They say my language or right. we're just talking. So ABSL and Chitino sign language are quite different. Um, Chitino Sign Language is much younger, the structure looks very different, they depend on the family that they socialize with. And so at the same times we have overlap with family signs. Everyone knows one another, language is common, um, and the family signs feed one another if you can say that. And so the community uh, has conventional gestures that kind of feed the family science as well. And so many things are happening at the same time. So is it kind of like the home sign system that were like at the beginning of uh, Nicaraguan sign language when the, so when Nicaragua established the first school for the deaf and pe all the people came from, from different villages or so on and they each had their own home signs yes. and then they like came in and developed Nicaraguan sign language because of the school? That's one way of looking at it, yes. My feeling is that home signs 
what psychologists and linguists call signs of one deaf child in a family that mm -hmm. they make up in the home. I think there's a lot more diversity to how home signs emerge. And because, again, it depends on the interaction, whether you have one deaf child or you have several deaf children or uh, deaf plus hearing interacting with one another using sign language. And so this one's different because they have 10 deaf people and they're all interacting with each other and so they can feed back into each other. Mm, well, yes and no. Uh, they don't identify as deaf, like culturally deaf. Okay. It's not a common belief. I'm not saying that it means that they don't have an identity. It just means they identify themselves as a family member first. Mm -hmm. And then they identify as a member of their community second. And everyone recognizes that they are different from other indigenous people who are not Chitino right. because of how they dress, uh, uh, the type of uh, rituals that they perform in their daily life, etc. That's really interesting. And also, I guess, to recognize uh, the difference between them and other Chitinos within the area. So deaf people do interact with their families who are related. Hmm. They visit one another. They will meet and talk or they'll go to the same family events, parties, community events, etc. If their family uh, isn't connected, then they have less chance of meeting another deaf person if they're not in the family. So if you have two deaf people meet at random on the street, they may say hello, if anything. But, you know, because you might don't be, talk to people outside the family. Maybe they may not talk uh, to one another. I'm sorry, say that again. Because they don't talk to people outside the family? Or there's more restrictions on that? I think it's because maybe they don't like each other. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. That's really neat. And you kept, so since your dissertation, you've also kept going back to this community. You were there this summer, um, and then you're, you know, still doing more projects. Yes. For my dissertation, I did focus on, I have to remember, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Yes, eight girls, four deaf, four hearing, all girls, it just so happened. And of the eight, they are among five families. So two types of groups that I study, deaf children with hearing parents and hearing children with one deaf parent. So the communities don't have deaf families. So they don't have two deaf parents with deaf children. They don't have anything like that. That's very rare in the world in general. Even rare in ABSL in that community. So I studied how they interact and how the languages emerge hmm. of sign language, how it happened. That was mostly my dissertation. I did go several summers, stayed one year at one time. And that was the only way for me to take full advantage of being immersed in the community and within the sign family. So I went in each family. Uh, I stayed for a bit. I uh, slept there. I ate with them. I visited with them. Then I went to one of the ranches that they have and just did the daily activities and daily life with them. Then I had to finish my dissertation. <laughs> that took a while. <laughs> and yeah, and you've also done some work on ASL as well, right? Yes. After I graduated, I got a postdoc for two years at UC San Diego. I had opportunity to work with Carol Patton, who is well known for her work on ABSL and ASL. And at that time, I took advantage of the opportunity to work on ASL. And um, <clears throat> let me back up. I have worked with Richard on ASL, mm -hmm. focusing on verbs. I love verbs. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> verbs are great. 
<laughs> yes, I agree. I agree. And uh, as a postdoc, I thought that was a wonderful opportunity for me to expand my research on ASL and to collaborate with Carol Padden and to compare Chitino Sign Language with ABSL mm. and use of space for grammar mm. as a specific uh, unit of study or unit of analysis. And ASL specifically uh, has something that I've noticed, which is very in interesting about things on the internet. More deaf people are filming themselves using sign language and then posting it on Facebook, uh, YouTube, and various social media sites. And it seems to be exploding recently. And so people will film themselves in the car and, you know, they have privacy, they can talk and post and people watch, and then they film themselves sometimes in responding. And so you can see a huge explosion with videos in the uh, signing. Because you can study these videos. Yes. Yes. The data is there. It's so good. It's so good. And I was watching, I can see data before my eyes. It's, it's in action. And I never thought for a moment that there could be another data uh, given on the internet. Mm. It's, it's right there. And you don't have to go might... with the camera and film yourself. Exactly. To the, it, it's a perfect point if you think about it. You can't go into a library and look for grammar. You have to look for deaf people. Mm -hmm. So one challenge that is unique to sign language, I think, is to look for deaf signers out there in general. And so for some researchers, they bring deaf people into the lab and they film their signing. But for me, I don't do that. As a deaf signer, I feel that language happens in the natural when mm. you're communicating and interacting with people. And it's a hard role for me because when I go to see my friends or go to a deaf event or a conference, and I see sign language research and people getting together to talk about things, they're not, you know, just going up. I, I can't bring a camera and say, here I am and film. I have to keep these things in the back of my mind. Interesting things do occur there. And so it's a huge dilemma for me because I don't want to bring deaf people into a lab artificially and film them. You have the I of, find what they do in a lab is not natural. You have the observer's paradox. Like once you start observing something or filming it, Exactly. That it changes. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's an ongoing problem. And I think everyone knows that it becomes, you know, people are aware that they're in a lab being videotaped. And deaf people are very well adapted to being able to meet researchers or hearing signers. And, you know, what do you want from me? <laughs> and, you know, what can I do to accommodate you? Or how can I answer this question? And it's a common problem with some of my hearing friends who look at me as a signer with other deaf friends. They say, you don't sign that way with me as a deaf person. Why are you signing that way? I said, oh, I didn't mean to. It's not intentional. I just, I code switch. So yeah. for hearing people, you change how you speak. I think some hearing people yeah, do that absolutely. too. Yeah, absolutely. And do. it's not only a second language user thing. I think it's just, you know, you have academic register, you have typical everyday conversation and chat. This is kind of, you know, like the classic sociolinguistic, like you go into a department store and you ask someone, where is the shoe section? And you're going to write that down rather than bring them into the lab and say, excuse me, can you tell me where is the shoe section? <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a very so, different response. Yes. So back to the internet data. And I thought, you know, as I'm watching films, this is a wonderful opportunity to research because deaf people are filming themselves and it's very powerful. And, and they're filming I, themselves for other deaf people. Exactly. And I, yes, I think the concept of uh, monologues and how they film themselves is not exactly how I would describe the film I'm watching because they're signing and they're talking and they're responding to what someone else has said. So it's a little bit different than a monologue. But the point I thought when looking at this data is that I could use videos to analyze and I could look at them and what they're saying, you know, and they could pick whatever they wanted to say and do their own video. And at the same time, they're signing naturally and spontaneous. 
And this was the focus of your talk at the Five Minute Linguist at the LSA last year, which was really good. Exactly. I really enjoyed that. remember that? that? <laughs> I'm embarrassed about what happened because the first video that I showed didn't quite work out. You recovered really well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's, the, that's the thing with live events. But yeah, so we can link to the, the video of that, which is also online. Uh, if people want to see what you found when you looked at uh, YouTube, like YouTube and how people sign on YouTube. Yes, what I uh, talked about in the five minute linguistics talk was showing how the video has evidence of how one verb to look at changes the meaning you can see the different functions and the different form. And so that is what I found from watching all these videos. That verb and how to analyze it has kept me busy. <laughs> and uh, I think the internet data helped me understand it much better because it truly represents language in the deaf community. I, I mean, it's so cool because this is what I like about internet data as well. Like, you can look for a new word on Twitter or something and, like, look, there's real people using it and you don't have to wait until it gets entered into a dictionary or until some lexicographer finally notices it and does it. It's just right there, people using it. Yes, exactly. It's also a good opportunity to see what signs deaf people are inventing mm. or how they're playing with signs. Uh, nuances, you know, talking with deaf friends about certain things that they've seen on Facebook or teaching me new signs, new concepts. And I think that that is how language spreads and changes because, you know, it's true for spoken language as well. Languages change and written too. Yeah. And it's great to actually have high quality video that people can send back and forth to each other rather than, you know, TTY or something. Yes. Oh my God. yes, I'm impressed that you know what a TTY means and used it accurately. I was like, wait, did I get that acronym right? Yeah, thinking about my first quarter, you know, I just finished my first quarter at UC Santa Barbara. One undergraduate student who was learning about ASL, uh, I, I suggested that they could watch a DVD. And they said, Oh, can I watch it online? And I thought, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, DVDs are like old now. And so, you know, talking about VHS, what's that? And I mentioned VHS and I thought, oh, what is VHS? Oh, never mind. Imagine never mind, shipping, never mind. shipping VHS to each other to communicate in video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The internet's a lot easier. Yeah, so back then, deaf people had to communicate through TTY. Which is... And the problem with TTY is that it looks like, you know, a small typewriter, uh, you have one line uh, that has the words, and then you wait for the person to say, go ahead, and then when they're done, it's your turn, and you type back. And they do have had paper, a uh, little printout, that you could read. But I remember one common joke is sometimes you'd read it and you didn't understand, and then you would wait until you met the person again and then you'd show them the paper and say what did you say here what does that mean tell me sign it to me and it's then like they really would do bad. it and then you'd be totally clear <laughs> because you're like what is this it's like really bad texting <laughs> yes exactly. I, I think that's a good parallel yes. and then the internet emerged and you know texting is you know so different now and easy we still can text and then now we can add video texting and uh, we could have emojis gifts yes exactly oh gifts love my uh, animated gifts I yes. notice you use a lot of gifts on Twitter uh, uh, yeah well people do too people, no everyone does yeah I think uh, what's fascinating is that people sometimes say how do I interpret that gif mm. you know so we talk about it it's the same yeah. thing with emojis because I noticed that the iPhone is adding new emojis all the time. And so I sent something and my friend, you know, rather regardless of hearing or deaf, would look at it and go, what's that? Are you cold or what? What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> it's like TTY. You have to wait till you see them in order to find out. Yeah, yeah. So um, the availability of the video, or um, rather for that kind of thing for technology is something that we cherish and we can communicate so easily now. And if we can't physically meet a person face to face, then it's much easier. Yeah. Back then we had to physically get together to communicate with yeah. one another. It's so hard. 
that there's, it's, it's, it's so great. Yeah. So the internet makes me, uh, allows me to possibly research on a new level. I still love interacting with deaf people in person, but it allows my research to be conducted easier. I don't have to bother deaf people in their daily life, ask them to come to the lab and, you know, then film them and feel like they're staring at me or the camera and it's artificial. At the same time, I do tell people, oh, I love your video that I saw online. Do you mind if I use it? And sometimes they're like, oh, yes, thank you. You like my video and that's so exciting. <laughs> and they feel really good about themselves. That's okay. Uh, well, it's so exciting to get to do this episode as a video because I didn't want to we had a number of requests to say, can you do something about signed languages? But we didn't want to do that in audio. Like, that's weird. So I'm really happy that, that you were able to join us. Uh, and I think that pretty much, you know, brings us to the end of uh, where we're going. But if there was one thing you could leave people knowing about linguistics or about sign languages or anything you work on, what, what would that be? Wow. <laughs> I have so many messages. Uh, let me pick Well, it is 2019. I think the world is changing. Deaf children uh, have, in some ways, more opportunities than they did before. So here, at least in the United States, deaf children can go to any school. We have interpreters available to them. They can also learn to speak and hear with technology sometimes, more than they used to in the past. I wrote a book chapter about that. We'll link to it. Yeah. Um, the opportunity for deaf children to learn with cochlear implants to speak and listen is fine. I don't think it means that that should happen to preclude learning mm. sign language. Because deaf people in the deaf community want to tell the world we are not opposed to the concept of deaf children learning to speak or to use any residual hearing. We love bilingualism. We love bi bimodal people who can write, who can sign, who can talk. The more communication, the better. But to learn sign language is vital. There is no harm in learning sign language as a child. One argument that I've heard time and time again is people in the world don't sign. They say, what should we learn for? Mm -hmm. You can make the same argument for many spoken languages that is not around the world. Why learn to speak Chitino? Well, <laughs> you know, if you think about it, the argument breaks down so easily because at no point m learning multiple language will hurt, harm anyone. You can apply that to sign language. Maybe you don't think about it in that view, but if you think about it as a language, that we can claim as ours and make it special to us as deaf people. Emergent sign language represent a beautiful facet of biodiversity. Mm. I like signing because it's fun, but I feel that it's something special about me. It represents who I am. I want people to understand that it's not about the language that they need to know for living in the world or traveling to a specific society, but it represents who you are and you can decide to use it or not. I think for deaf children at large, they should have the opportunity to learn sign language and then it's up to them whether they use it or not. When you interview people about spoken language of various different ones, a beautiful IPA scarf, I love, I had it, and uh, weird symbols, just beautiful. But I would ask the audience to think for a moment what makes language a language that's not related to sound or sign. It's something I've been thinking about for a very, very long time. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com or check out the show notes below. 
You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get in Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. Lauren tweets and blogs as Superlinguo, and you can follow our guest, Lena Ho, on Twitter at Lena Science. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you could rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio and video producer is Claire Gaughan, and our editorial producers are Emily Greth, A.E. Prevot, and Sarah Dothiorella. And our music is by The Triangles. Special thanks to the Linguistic Society of America for providing a room for this interview, Daniel Midgley for filming, and Malapo for interpreting. Stay Lingthusiastic! Enthusiastic!